All right, I believe we're live here with Daria Little. Hi, Daria. Hi, Cameron. So uh, I have my four kids currently asleep, and my my wife <laughs> is uh, managing all that. And so hopefully there's no interruptions. But I imagine you just got your kids to sleep too, right? Uh, no, uh, it's <laughs> only 7.30 here, and they don't go to bed another three hours. So my husband <laughs> is bribing them with Dairy Queen ice cream, I think. So. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. Um, Daria, I'm really glad to talk to you. I'm really honored you would uh, come on this uh, podcast with me. Uh, the reason why I wanted to talk to you is because I think you have a really interesting story about converting from Islam to Christianity to ultimately traditional Catholicism. Um, and I want to talk about that. But first, you've written a couple books. Uh, one book is on, I mean, you've written several books, but... I think your most popular recent ones are from from Islam to Christ, uh, One Woman's Path Through the Riddles of God, and then what you and I were just talking about uh, before we went live, A Beginner's Guide to the Traditional Latin Mass. It's so mm -hmm. cool. Can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, my pleasure. Um, here is the book. It's uh, We've self-published it first, but then now Angelica Press picked it up, and um, you can order it on their side but we have an amazing artist his um his name is chris lewis but he's um uh he goes by baritus catholic and if you've never seen his art it's a, it's phenomenal so go and check his website it's it's wonderful but we uh we created this book it was my husband's idea because he was the first comer i've been going to latin mass for a while and he picked it up the red little red book at the mass and he's like even this is so confusing isn't there anything simple simpler and we looked it up and there was nothing so here we are um it looks like it's for kids because it has pictures however it's not <laughs> <laughs> so because if you've never been to latin mass and you grew up in ordinary form even you go and it feels so different okay. at first you don't even realize that <laughs> it, it's the it's the liturg liturgy of the same church um, I mean, I think once you become familiar, then you're like, oh, there it is, there it is. But at first, it's very unfamiliar. So this yeah. is what we did. Let me find a um, page. Okay. So the uh, so on the right side, so this is for high mass. We have low mass too. So on the right side, we explain in the most simple terms what is going on. Mm. And uh, Chris uh, illustrated the position of the priest during mass, yes. which will give you a clue. Um, about where what's happening during mass and on the left side if you have time which is <laughs> latin mass you always do we ex we explain a little bit what's going on like for instance this is the collect and the epistle and the gradual like because it's the it's different than the ordinary form so um that's how it is and again more pictures and you know <laughs> that's awesome it's, I think um, this is for if you've never been or if you have little kids, you you will use this for about two months and then you can graduate to the red missile and eventually your own big boy missile. Um, <laughs> I haven't yet because I have kids. I have never time to open up a big missile and follow what's going on. I haven't heard a homily for the last nine years. You know, so, <laughs> um, Is that because you're in the back of church most of the time? Yeah, and it's like or outside. they all want to talk and you kind of, you know, wrestle them all the time. And then uh, with the, again, with the help of my husband, we put together this like this little section about the next step, how to use your big boy missile with the ribbons and, you know, where to place the ribbons and such. So, yeah, so that's the book. And um, we just, we see that there's an increasing um, demand for the land mass and interest. And I think this is a good place to start. So um, if you get it, let me know if it works for you or whether it can be improved or not. So, yeah. There, there was one, one question that actually just came in about the beginner's guide from Amanda. She said, um, you might know what she means by this. Um, the first part doesn't seem to match up with what our priest does. What might explain that? Uh, there are, it's not strict, like there are different rites. For instance, I used to go to a Dominican rite in England. So the priest did some stuff differently than that. And also she, uh, we need to make sure that it's low mass or high mass. So high mass is different than the low mass. So it's not strict. This is, this is to give you a general idea. Mm -hmm. 
additionally, there is no strict rules for the laity. Like you can sit there and pray your rosary the whole time. Um, but what happens is you just want to kind of blend in and, and stand when people stand and kneel where, when people kneel. So we kind of try to give you a general idea. Um, so wherever you go, whatever your priest does is, I'm assuming, okay. <laughs> I'm assuming your priest knows how to say the Latin Mass. Um, so you can adjust it. You can take notes. That's one of the reasons there's like blank, um, you know, blank parts. It's like, okay, this is the little part we uh, do differently because it is slightly different according to the region, the right, where your priests learn how to say the Mass. Those are the, they, they should be minor differences, mm, but yeah. it's normal. Yeah. Yeah. When we're talking about those kinds of differences, it's very minor. Um, because you're talking about differences within entire rites or differences within entire geographic regions. Right. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I spent a lot of my time in the back of church or outside of church, especially <laughs> with our firstborn. Um, like most masses, for most of the mass, I wasn't actually in the building itself. I was walking outside trying to put her to sleep. Um mm -hmm. I'm, so you said you haven't heard a homily in nine years. It just made me think of that. Oh, yeah. I, I used to think, it's like, how far can I go from the church before? <laughs> but, like, yeah. It's not valid. Like, can Lord, I, I hope there's no distance. I drive in the car, like, around the block? I know I, I can't, <laughs> exactly. like, drive home, but if I'm just close <laughs> enough on the on the <laughs> sidewalk. Um, yeah, that's great. So I, I would love to hear how you... You can go into as much of your story as you want, but how did you discover the Latin Mass? Okay, so, um, like, my story is very long, so I just want to <laughs> talk about the Latin Mass. Sure. So, I was raised a Muslim, and I think um, that kind of gave me a sense of reverence. So, if you're, you're familiar with Islam at all, they have um, Allah is the absolute master, and the Muslim is, the Muslim is his slave. Mm. So when you go to a mosque, you feel his master. <laughs> you know, you are, you like, you you kneel, like not the way we kneel, you know, you prostrate yourself and it's absolute quiet. And there's this whole ablution ceremony before you can even enter the mosque. And of course there's strict dress codes. And um, like for women, <laughs> if you're on your period, you're, you know, you're not clean enough to enter the mosque. So like wow. there is this whole sense of you're, um, you're worshiping something mighty. So I grew up with that sense of awe and reverence. And of course I lost it as an atheist. And when I came, uh, when I became a Christian, uh, I was part of a Protestant charismatic church and it just didn't, it, it just didn't click with me. And it's not necessarily because I'm Muslim. I grew up Muslim. Uh, I think it, it the way are uh, my own this is this could be my own personal struggle as well. My pride work that I just saw a weaker God, mm. if that makes sense. Wow. Uh, even though I was obviously I was a Christian, I could, you know, um, I believed everything that Jesus was God. It, it just didn't my my posture, my worship did not reflect that he was divine. Um, that was so because think, it was, sorry to interrupt, that was because it was, yeah. um, like, can you go into that a little bit? Is that because it was strictly charismatic or was it overly emotional? Or yes, it was overly emotional and um, wherever you put up a sign saying that this is a church, it was a church and then you mm -hmm. kind of, um, I don't, I, I think uh, one of the reasons of that is the, the Protestantism lacks not only the sacramentality, but it, there is no connection between the, it's almost like there's no connection between the physical world and the spiritual world. So, um, which is completely different the way Catholics see the world, right? Like in our, in our view, the physical and the spiritual is always intertwined. We wear yeah. medals, you know, we have crucifixes. Um, the, God, the Lord, God can use things like actual physical things as um as channels of grace we have the eucharist holy water so when you don't have that in the protestant church it's just um it's it becomes almost like gnostic in a way that um 
the, this like physical world is almost evil or uh, like even when it's or not it doesn't evil, matter yeah it doesn't matter right yeah. it doesn't have any consequence but of course our posture matters um so i didn't see the respect and that awe but i was like it's okay you know this is the truth it's fine and the very first time i went to a catholic mass it was in istanbul uh, don't get mad because i don't say constantinople I'm not mad. <laughs> um, so uh, it was this really old church saint antoine saint anthony's run, run by franciscans and it wasn't a like now that looking back it wasn't a <laughs> um like a really reverent mass i mean it was obviously you know it's, it was new mass but it would even then i felt like okay this building seems like this is a place you can worship God. This is a, like a really old, beautiful church. And um, then I eventually, long story short, I got confirmed in England. And um, I had a friend there who attended to a Dominican Rite uh, Latin Mass. And he, when he took me there, I, was like, I felt like I stepped out of time. And um, like, and it's just step up. <laughs> through the time to a higher place it was like everything was left behind and this it, and it was beautiful and it wasn't very like there weren't that many people but i could say okay this is the reverence i looked for and i didn't know what i was looking for and uh, my biggest um like my first thought was like okay this is a god before whom i can kneel because again this could be my personal problem um, you know, I struggled with pr pride and, you know, um, as many of us do. So I'm like, I am really not going to kneel before you if you're so squishy. So, so and squishy? I always, is that what yeah, you're squishy. It's like all this like teddy bear. Jesus is our buddy. I'm like, he has chosen to be our friend. We can't pull him down. He can't, you know, he can will, he can bring himself down. But our worship needs to show that he is God. And if he lowers himself to our, um, to our level, which he does at every mass, like I can't pull him down to my level. Like I need to still kneel and accept him as the divine. And I, that's what I found at Latin mass. Mm -hmm. So I went to Latin mass there for almost two years and I got married and moved here. <laughs> And it was not a good experience because my poor husband, who is also a convert, um, in the area of Pennsylvania we live in, it's, there were some abuses. Uh, nothing that would make you question the validity of mass, but I, like I, I've come from a Latin mass for so long that I was just complaining about everything all the time. My husband's like, what is wrong with you? Like, it's not that bad. So his level, his, the way he says, is like, there aren't that many abuses here because that's all he's seen. And, but because I've seen the Latin mass and I was like, you know, it could be so much better. Yeah. It could be so much more beautiful. So, um, you know, I had, I had a friend who, who said to me one time I was, it was actually recently after attending Latin mass for the first time and I was going regularly. And then occasionally I'd go back and attend Nova Sordo. Of course, there's there's Nova Sorda parishes that are reverent and all that, but there's many that that seem to be irreverent, or or maybe the mainstay word would be casual. They're just casual right. in in the presence of Almighty God. And I remember my friend saying something very wise. He said, "You know, people can either become okay with what's going on and kind of complacent and kind of just like." The, the more you go to this kind of mass, the more it doesn't bother you. Or you can, you can like, do something with that anger and channel it and not become bitter, like, on the inside, like, not constantly critiquing the mass, um, but channel it into something good. Like, see, see the good in it. And um, that really helped me. Like, w we should be upset because we right. believe that that is Almighty God. And, um, but it shouldn't, like be turned inward and make us all bitter and <laughs> right and hateful it does happen all too often unfortunately because uh, we feel trapped like most often there's not much you can do unless you are willing to travel like we drive an hour 20 minutes to a latin mass now wow. and we cross like 
I don't know, like countless other, you know, Catholic churches to get yeah. there. So sometimes like we feel trapped, but it's not the, it's not the end. Like now we started to shuttle our other people who are willing to come um, with us to Latin mass and make the drive. So like, there's always something you can do or, um, but I think you're right. Like you need to do something positive with that dissatisfaction and definitely not become complacent because that's one of the things happened to me. So I went to this Latin mass all these two years, came back, and we didn't have a reason really to drive that far yet. Like we hadn't had kids or, you know, old enough kids to care. And I was like, next thing it, I'm wearing jeans and a t-shirt to church. Mm. Like <laughs> it doesn't even come. It's like that's proverbial being boiled to death, right? Like slowly, hey, I don't want to stand out getting like wearing dresses every time or I don't yeah. want, to, you know, so it's like you kind of, as you say, you become complacent. And the ugliness just doesn't bother you anymore or irreverence. So you're right. Like just, you know, take that anger and turn it into something positive, but mm -hmm. don't ever become, you know, lukewarm or complacent. Offer it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Offer it up. Oh, pray yeah. pray oh. for your brothers and sisters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I love that line. You said, this is a God to whom I could kneel. Mm -hmm. That's, that's totally my experience too. So as, as a former Muslim, coming to the traditional Latin mass, can you talk more about how you felt home? Um, it's, it's interesting because we, I have a missionary friend who works in uh, Muslim countries. And um, this is one of the things I say, we have what it takes to bring Muslims into the fold. If uh, this is mm. at all possible, it's not a very fertile ground within the Catholic church, because they already have that sense of awe and reverence. And, um, yeah. and what happens is like, you can't just throw all these like men and women into a completely um, casual, as you say, environment, but in the traditional mass, like, look, yes, this is still the creator of the universe. And, you know, he created the stars and the planets and this like cosmos beyond us. Yet he deigned to become one of us and died for us. And now he comes to us in the Holy Eucharist. So I think it's an it's almost like easier to explain as complex as Latin mass seem to many, pe seem to many people. It, it makes <laughs> to me, it makes more sense. Like if there is actually a God and he has chosen to become man this is how he should be worshiped this he would have like he would have asked he would have let us know how we should worship him which you know like latin mass it has you go back in the old testament i'm sure when you, you, your interviewees have talked about it um yeah you go back and there's just all this old testament stuff because it's not like one day Jesus shows up and he's like, oh, forget a lot, forget about all that stuff. You know, it's <laughs> it's all look, no, he has revealed us. And I think that creates a continuity of what we actually believe and how we actually pray. Yeah. Um, yeah, we know think, Yeah, we sorry to interrupt. We know how uh to worship God, just like you said, because only because it was revealed to us through right. Moses, <laughs> like through this intermediary, through the law in the desert worship me in these ways these very specific you could call them rubrics right and today you know we only know how to worship god in the way he wants to be worshiped because of the church which right. christ has established right i mean like consider our dinner table i don't let my kids eat however they want with their you know like my five-year-old would be very happy to eat like a puppy dog you know, without any utensils, or they would like to eat on the floor watching TV all the time. Uh, but no, even from our own children, we expect, we teach them how to behave, how to act in front of other adults, and how much more God loves us that he wouldn't just leave us to our own devices to kind of wander through this crazy world without knowing how to appease him or how to approach him. So um, I think um, for Muslims, traditional Latin mass is just, it would make a um, better impression. Actually, I had, um, I heard from people who live in Muslim countries, they visit Europe 
and um, a few of them stumbled in to a beautiful cathedral or a church during Latin mass and they were very impressed with the way this worship was taking place and um, I mean and they reached out to me that the beauty of the church combined with the worship was really attractive to him because to them because um, uh, that's how the physical world is the way we worship is one of the ways the Lord reaches us and I think as you say this is the it makes a difference to a Muslim it's almost easier for them to understand that than um, for a Westerner who has never quite witnessed this reverence and grew up with this idea of individualism and equality and you know we're you know uh, does that make sense it's almost like uh tell me if this is a good way to describe it you had experiences as in islam for this this awe and reverence this kind of god who's who's worthy of worship and he's kind of over and above me he's he's bigger than me but then you have this experience of in the charismatic uh church where you have access to god and god is this you know uh, experience and he's he's very personal mm -hmm. but then the latin mass you kind of have the best of both worlds because you ha you have this awe mm -hmm. now of course there's there's fundamental differences between the god of islam and the god of christianity yes. which I, I think you would agree with uh, but uh, just as an analogy, you have the best of both worlds where you have this awe and reverence mm -hmm. of, of a king. Uh, like you said, a, a king I can kneel before, a god I can kneel before, but also this this access to him. That he, this king right. is my friend, and he, in his Eucharist, comes into me, um, and I have complete access to him. So it's kind of like, it, 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 it sounds like a great evangelistic tool if you could, if you could even call it that, for both Muslims and, you know, the charismatic church or, or Protestants, even. I don't no, know. I agree. And the um, charismatic stuff, even within the Catholic Church as well, um, it's almost like it it brings people closer to Christ, because yes, He has chosen to be our friend, and we should accept that friendship, obviously, and we should have a personal relationship, as the as yeah. the Protestants um, say. However, it can't stay in that emotional high. I think the traditional, the way the traditional Latin mass shows worship is it's, it's even. It doesn't matter if you're feeling really happy, sad, or like it's kind of, I don't want to say it's devoid of emotion, but it's just um, neutralizes all that, you know, up and down of the <laughs> human, human psyche. Like yeah. if you're going through a grief, um, like I had a friend who lost the, who lost the child and, uh, she said she feels like there is no room. She goes to a non-denominational non church and she feels like there's no room for her in this happy world, like in this happy, you know, bubbly Protestant world anymore, because she's like struggling with this grief. Whereas like, if you go to the Latin mass and bring that to the Lord, it belongs there. Mm -hmm. If you're so joyful, it, it still belongs there. It's just... We all become truly equal before God, I think, du during the Latin Mass. And as you say, it's a perfect tool for evangelization. If we can stop being cranky. <laughs> 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 yeah. Don't be cranky. <laughs> yeah, don't be cranky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I totally see that. I, I Even even myself. So I'm, I'm actually a product of, you could say, a product of the new evangelization. So I had an experience on a retreat where I realized this... Jesus, you know, I grew up in a good Catholic family. I knew the the catechism answers. I knew that the Eucharist was Jesus, but I didn't really know Jesus as a personal, right. like, in a personal way until I had this experience on a retreat. But then there was this kind of emotionalism that I'd bring to Mass, this kind of like, I would go to Mass to experience some sort of satisfaction. Right. Um, I would go to, like, experience something. Now, <laughs> when I started going to Latin Mass, and like we talked about, I'm in the I'm in the back for the entire Mass. I'm not really hearing anything. I still would feel like I'm reoriented for the rest of the week. I would still feel um, deeply connected with the Lord. Um, 
And I think it's because this sense of sacrifice and obedience to him. Like I would go to mass to offer sacrifice to him, to lay my sacrifice down mm -hmm. uh, on the altar. And that sometimes meant I, I'm very literally like thinking of, I wish I was in the church and I can't be in the church and I have to be with the screaming baby and that's my sacrifice. And now it's on the altar. And uh, yeah, I, there is this kind of emotionalism satisfaction sense, I think, in a lot of people who go to go to mass. And it should be, we should add to that this sense of obedience to the way God wants to be worshipped and sacrifice, offering him a sacrifice in that mm -hmm. sense. That's um, so, so how do you see, so the theme of this documentary that we're producing is uh, Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi. So the law of prayer is the law of belief or the law of prayer, the way we worship is, has the most effect on what we believe. Um, how have you seen that to be true? Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi. I think we touched on it a little bit um, yeah. with my experiences at different places that we worship. And um, like since we started going to Latin Mass, as you say, I think that's one of the things, the ways to explain it. I feel a lot more oriented. And to be honest, I do miss most of the mass. Like I still use my the my own book. That <laughs> you know, just like wait, where are you? Where is the priest? On you the bring altar? a stack of books. You're like, this is my books. <laughs> <laughs> yes, don't touch them. Yeah, and the kids demolished so many of them anyway. But um, you, it's it's as you say, it's not about me or my like my verbal participation, but as you say, my p participation through obedience. Mm. So. Like it, and we do make a sacrifice to go. I mean, we haven't started since the masses started here. It's been a little crazy, but we do make a sacrifice to travel and take our kids there so they can see this worship. Like we want them to grow up in the Latin mass. We want them to see that, look, this is how we worship God. And even though he's so amazing, he's so beyond our comprehension. He comes to us. So, and that kind of view, as you say, the way we pray, the way we worship, trickles down, trickles down to our daily lives. Like for me, over the years, it resulted in being more obedient and I know my place a little better. I don't wanna say I am, I am humbler <laughs> because it kind of defeats the purpose, but it's kind of like, okay, God is here. The church is here and I'm here and it's a beautiful place to be. And it's kind of, I don't have to be all things to all people all the time. It just reoriented me within my life because I know who God is because of the way we pray. And now we are trying to show that to our children. Like you don't have to um, have all these emotional feelings. You don't have to sing songs all the time. All you need to know is, you know, they are learning from the Baltimore Cate Catechism, this, and know that this is this is God who have, who loves you so much. So I, um, for our family life, it made a big difference. And obviously, there are more graces. So this is all like, in the human world, and the graces we receive from, as you say, making the sacrifice to drive, making the sacrifice to miss mass. <laughs> One of us always miss. So there's all the extra graces that we receive from uh, going to going to mass. So um, I hope that answers. It's not like one way, but our whole world, our family world, is kind of revolves around the Latin mass. It just creates a good momentum for us to kind of, okay, this is how we pray. This is how we live. And this is how we live our lives as Catholics. I, I had another question, but I, I wonder if it was already answered. It's about how, how it is raising your family with the Latin mass, like four kids in the pews. Mm -hmm. it, it's very often difficult because, um, you know, you're experiencing mostly silence and uh, you don't want to disrupt people and you're trying to, to pray the mass. So do you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, it's one, It was when we decided to go to land mass, we called the priest ahead of time 
and we asked like okay our kids are crazy so can we still come basically <laughs> I mean, you know, really <laughs> you yeah, call we them did. It's like, <laughs> they have four kids there you know two years apart now our oldest is nine i mean back then he was only seven i mean so you can imagine the craziness. He's like, oh, it's filled with kids. I don't even hear them. You think you're going to distract the priest, but it's not like the priest is looking at you all the time, right? Yeah. It's one of the good things about Adoriantem. The priest is not going to see whose kid is misbehaving. It's definitely not my kid, obviously. But um, one of the good surprises were, um, well, two actually. The first one was the children behaved, behaved better at Latin Mass. I don't know why they may be yeah. on the silence or I have no idea why either. <laughs> I've yeah, noticed I don't that. Know yeah. why. Like we, the little ones. Yeah. We need to take them out, but three and up, like our youngest is three now. They're fine. We don't have to take them out. Occasionally I hear half a homily, homily. So it's not bad, you know, so um, they behave better. So that was a good surprise, but also there are a lot of other kids. So you kind of share the blame in the collective <laughs> <laughs> cry because um one of in the area we live in we are the weird catholic couple with four kids uh mm. lord willing soon to be five awesome. and uh where we go there like we're a small family here husband we need more kids <laughs> we just won't do anymore we so, don't fit in anymore <laughs> know, we don't just, have enough yeah we never fit, fit, fit <laughs> anywhere so like your kids won't be the only ones and uh, yeah. i've always felt welcome will yeah. there be an occasional cranky old lady yes there will be and we pray for them and we tell them god loves children and move on because mm -hmm. like you know somebody told us off because our kids were being you know we're like we have four kids they've been pretty quiet and you gave them palm leaves <laughs> so I don't know why we do it still, but so, but um, our experience have been like mostly positive. So there's yeah. a ton of young families and young kids, new babies at the Latin Mass. Mm -hmm. We had we're having three baptisms in a week, um, including our Ellen, who's just born. Um, oh, actually, maybe cool. four, four in like ten days. So there's a ton of a ton of babies. It's it's wonderful. They all cry together. So it's like, it wasn't mine. I think it was this one. Um, no, and it's beautiful. You see that, you know, the Lord wants that. Yes. The Lord doesn't want them in a cry room. But I mean, I'm not saying there won't be cranky people, but, you know, mostly it's it's going to be good. So don't be afraid of bringing your children to Latin Mass. They will fit in there and belong there. That's wonderful. I'm glad you said that. So we have some questions coming in. Uh, we'll just take them in the order they were received. Okay. Uh, this is from Jacob. Having converted from Islam, what was your first reaction of Catholic worship? So I think you, I think you talked about this, uh, but can you can you give us any more details about walking into the 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 church for the first time? I I met. Well, you said you went to Nova Sordo for the first time, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Right. Um. So I was an atheist for a long time and a Protestant. And you know how Protestants don't really talk about the crucifix or the cross. And the very first time I went, w walked into that Novus Ordo Mass, there was a, obviously a crucifix. And right. I was like, you Catholics, I wasn't a Catholic yet. You Catholics, you need to bring him down from the cross. He resurrected. Um, so I think the biggest jump in my understanding was to appreciate the passion more. And um, then when I attended mass, I could see the sorrow in the passion with the ending with the joy of the resurrection. Does it, does it make sense? Because it's sad, it's sacrifice, but yet there is so much joy because he comes us in the Eucharist because of his sacrifice. So that was my very first experience. Um, but again, like I was an atheist longer than I was a Muslim basically so it, there was a shift in my understanding of um, who Jesus is but even though it was a uh, ordinary form mass the reverence was still a lot more than what I had experienced in Protestant churches hmm. that's great so this is from Anga what do you personally think about the Novus Ordo and how it is different to the Latin mass um 
I am not one of those people who would get up and say it's invalid, but I feel like, okay, so this is my best illustration that comes to my mind. So you want to, you need a shelter from the blizzard that is the world. So you can go to this, this tiny hut that's made of straws and it's like leaking at certain points and it will keep you away from the blizzard but it's just not going to want you to like, it doesn't make you want to stay <laughs> necessarily. So I feel like that's how I felt in the Nova Sorda mass. Um, or when I go to Latin mass, I feel like it's this huge, beautifully done mansion and you want to explore each room and you want to come back. And if it's possible, you could live there. <laughs> so it's, it, there is a difference. And obviously like, in Turkey, when I converted in Ankara, there were a city of my f- 5 million. There were only two masses, both new masses. I couldn't be more grateful. And um, for some people, like if they have never been to a Catholic church, sometimes it's good to take them to the new mass first, hopefully a good reverent one to kind of get them acclimated to the Catholic worship. But I feel like it's almost like bare bones. Like it could be so much more. Mm. And Latin mass is that mansion to me. So I kind of really don't want to go back to the straw hut. Um, but I'm not saying the hut won't you. Um, the hut's still a house and it will keep you dry, you know. Right. Um, but I like that analogy. I'm picturing myself at like a roaring fire, like with in this beautiful, you know, room with lined with all these books, and like Beauty right. and the Beast, you know. Just like that. <laughs> yes, of course. There, <laughs> there must be books. So that's the idea. And I think um, I re- most of us, I, maybe because my husband and, and I are converts and it's not like we have a, like, um, like we don't have this grudge from that comes with the past. We're like, okay, I want to be a good Catholic. I want to be a faithful Catholic. I want to raise my ch- children ca- faithful Catholics. Like, Where can I do this best? Where can I nurture my own soul and pass it on to my family? And that's how I see the Latin mass. And in Novo Sordo, you're like, okay, is this homily okay? Like, do I have to check all their CCD books? Like, is this teacher okay? It doesn't make sense. It's always this constant struggle. Um, Whereas I, so far, I'm sure there's cookie Latin mass priests too, uh, as they are everywhere or teachers. But I feel like I can let my guard down and let the church in a little, you know, safely. It's like, okay, this is the faith we believe. So I don't want people to think that this is like a rivalry um, between, you know, no sort of or extra, extraordinary form and ordinary form. It's more like, okay, this is the best I can give to my family. Why wouldn't I? Mm. Right. Why wouldn't I let them live in the mansion, basically? Yeah, that's it. And taking the analogy one step further, it's like this mansion was built for 2000 years. Like it took a long time to construct it. All these rooms, like all this, all all these decorations, the paint and everything. Um, And if you want what's best for, especially for your kids, like give them something that the church has built for 2000 years uh, versus, um, something that was constructed rather quickly it still gets the job done it's still still has these features but i I like that analogy it makes me feel like i want to go to that mansion that's awesome uh this is from jacob if you grew up going to mosque in a different language what was the lat was the latin a hurdle for you when discovering the traditional latin mess um I, I hear this from Americans a lot because it's a basically monolingual culture and Turkey is very similar, but, um, so all the Muslims prayer, all the Muslim prayers are in, in Arabic, um, because Allah only speaks Arabic possibly. I'm not sure. <laughs> so like oh. you can't pray, uh, the lang in your native language. So there's no, uh, vernacular or anything like that in, um, in, in Islam. Uh, so I, I was more familiar with the concept of having a different worship language. Mm-hmm. And the truth is, our three-year-old kind of knows Hail Mary in Latin. 
Awesome. Hearing. Wow. So not that he, she understands it. And it's very like, if you pay attention, you will pick up a lot of the words. You don't have to be fluent in Latin. And, um, and that's not to say like, you should say all your personal prayers in Latin. Obviously like my husband and I, we pray the rosary in English, but we do pray the luminous mysteries in Latin Cameron. <laughs> make everybody mad <laughs> that's not true but we're like hey let's agitate everyone what's gonna happen um but um it's just like you pick it up really quickly i mean our nine-year-old shows off the up <laughs> there shows off to his friends which is like latin uh, uh in that the name so of the cool. father the son, and so it's not hard to pick up so don't be intimidated um it's weird at first because Again, most Westerners aren't used to the idea, but it's it's not bad. And there's so much room in our brains. We can put, you know, stuff in a little bit of Latin in there without any long-term damage. So, yeah. <laughs> Luminous Mysteries in Latin. I got to try that. Sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, that's all the questions that came in, but I just want to give a final uh, plug, first of all, for your, your books. Um, so... If you want to hear more of Daria's story, she wrote a book on it. Um, it's really detailed. It's called From Islam to Christ, mm -hmm. One One Woman's Path Through the Riddles of God. And we can have a link for that in the comments uh, below. And then the, the book she showed us earlier, A Beginner's Guide to the Traditional Latin Mass. This is for anyone who's a beginner. And I feel like I've just begun sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so much to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Pick it up. Um, we'll have that in the link as well. Mm -hmm. Last time I checked, we have raised just over 20,000, uh, which is 26% of our goal. Uh, we have little over two weeks left. Uh, really excited. We have a lot of momentum right now. And this is what I, I did a little math before this. So we have um, 1,800 people who. Uh, follow us on Facebook right now as as of this recording. We have uh, 218 backers. So there's about 1,600 people who like what we're doing but haven't yet uh, given. And if we got just half of those people giving at the $25 level, which gets you complete access, all the uncut interviews, uh, you get you know first dibs on, on everything once it comes out, uh, and you're supporting this great work, if we get just half of those people, so let's say 800 people who currently like us on Facebook, so I'm talking to you right now, um, if you haven't given, then we would reach 50% of our goal. And here's the cool thing. The Kickstarter stats say that when you reach 50% of your goal, you have a 96% chance of getting fully funded. So if 800 people tonight and tomorrow as you watch this video as you share it with your friends if if 800 people give 25 dollars, we will hit 50 percent of our goal and be 96 percent likely to get fully funded so i think we can pull that off i think we should do it all right thank you everyone and thanks for tuning in daria thank you for all your work and i love your joy and enthusiasm <laughs> For the Latin Mass. Uh, we need more of that. Stop being cranky, people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have Bye. a good night. Peace.